Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the Crop Phenotyping and Soil Health webinar really focused on bridging the gap between science and practice. My name is Jenna Ross and I'm the International Business Development Manager for UK Agritech Centre Crop Health and Protection and today I'm joined by colleagues from Crop Health and Protection, our sister centre AgriEpi, as well as our delivery partner Cranfield University. And today we're really going to be showcasing our facilities. Oops, apologies. Um, so, um, first of all, I want to get, I'm going to be introducing the, the um, schedule, then we'll be introducing the speakers for today. But before we go deeper into that, first of all, a little bit of housekeeping. If you've got any questions during the webinar, please feel free to pop these into the Q&A box along the, the ribbon along the bottom of your screen. And finally, today's webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a copy of the recording following the event. So just to give you a bit of an idea of today's agenda, we're going to kickstart with an introduction to the Agritech centres, both CHAP and AgriEpi. We're then going to delve into the main body of today's event, which is really around the phenotyping and soil health facility. We'll then open the floor for questions based on those presentations. Then we have a very exciting announcement on the Agritech centres that will take place at the end of the webinar, and then we'll aim to finish up around about 1 p.m. So let's get started. So first of all, I want to introduce you to our panel of speakers. Our first speaker is Lindsay Creswell, who is the Commercial Director for CHAP. Lindsay will be followed by Duncan Ross, who is the Business Development Manager for Crops and Horticulture AgriEpi. We'll then delve into our main speakers of the event. First up will be Dr. Toby Wayne, who is a senior lecturer in applied and um, remote sensing at Cranfield University. And then Toby will be followed by Professor Wilfred Otten, who is a professor in soil biophysics, also at Cranfield University. So to kickstart the event and to get us introduced into the Agritech centres, I'm going to invite Lindsay and Duncan to share their presentations. Over to you. Good afternoon. I'm Lindsay Creswell, the Commercial Director here at CHAP. As some of you might already know, we're one of four centres um, funded by Innovate UK and set up in about 2016. We have CHAP, which is Crop Health and Protection. We have AgriEpi, who you'll learn a bit more about um, with Duncan after me, and they focus very much on engineering and precision agriculture. We have CL, who are the Centre of Excellence for, um, for Livestock, and we're underpinned by Agrimetrics, whose focus is on big data. Here, CHAP's specific ambition is to expedite a pipeline of innovative crop-based agritech products and solutions for the industry. So how do we work? This is something we're often asked. Um, so CHAP is a catalyst for innovation. We have a new innovations process which brings together partners and other stakeholders to sort of collectively work on problems in the area to design and fund um, multidisciplinary collaborations to tackle the challenges in uh, prop, uh, crop production. Uh, then we promote collaboration. Uh, we're developing networks of new opportunities with collaborators uh, innovation, demonstration, knowledge exchange and, bus and businesses. Um, we enhance our trusted delivery by enhancing our support for our, our partners and our collaborators uh, and customers and projects with professional project management programs. And we're accelerating, um, accelerating the translation from basic research to adoption by the, section, the sector using our uh, facilities and our partners expertise through grants and commercial projects. Um, so this slide just gives you a uh, rough idea of who our partners are. Uh, we have non-delivery partners who are Bayer, ADAS, Tesco's and Frontier. And then we have delivery partners scattered throughout the country. Up in Scotland at Dundee, we have Liberty Produce at the, at the Hutton Institute, where we have our innovation hub for controlled environment agriculture. Moving down the, um, the East Coast, we come to Newcastle University, where we have facilities with some molecular diagnostic um, capability and also our mobile labs. Ferrer at York, uh, where we've developed, they've developed for us um, our Crop Monitor Pro product, which is a decision support tool, and also our eFlow Mesocosm. At STC, we have our vertical farm development facility and also an advanced glasshouse for biopesticide studies. At AHDB, we, at Sutton Bridge, we have our crop storage 
uh, research facility. In Cambridge, we have NIAB, where we have our molecular diagnostics laboratory. And at Rothamsted, we have our fine phenotyping lab. At CABI, we have our national reference collection, uh, in, uh, international horizon scanning, and also fungal biopesticide lab. And here at Cranfield, we have the phenotyping and soil health facility. And then at Warwick University, we have RIPE and our natural light glass house. So just focusing today on the phenotyping and soil health facility, uh, Wilfred and Toby obviously speak in more detail about this, but I want you to see that it's a unique capability to replicate um, the whole of the cropping cycle from tillage to post harvest. Um, the fact that it's weather independent, we can do studies above and below ground um, and the facilities are fully integrated with the um, AgriEpi phenotyping platform and it works to improve our understanding of soil management overall. Just finally, in summary, just to let you know, that this is from last year, but obviously last year we carried out 77 projects. We engaged with over 32,000 um, people in the sector. We brought 11.2 million value to the sector and published 133 pieces of content. So if you have any questions on any of these facilities or anything uh, regarding a CHAP and how we work, please contact me via this email um, address and we'll send out a summary of CHAP's uh, strategy and any collateral after this presentation. And uh, thank you very much and I'll hand over to Duncan. Good afternoon, my name is Don Ross and I'm the Business Development Manager of the Crop Sector for Agri Epicenter. And I'm here to speak to you today about the Agri Epicenter and our crop technology capability. So the three main objectives of AgriEpi are to be a key player to ensure that the UK grows its status in agritech. We operate a wide range of industry-led activity in research and development, and we ensure that knowledge that's generated is transmitted to a wider audience. We consider ourselves to be an enabler. We are good access to leading academic institutions such as Cranfield, Harper Adams, Edinburgh University, and many more. We broker collaborations with those university partners, but also our network of members. We test and demonstrate new technology, both in our assets at the various hubs we have, and also our wider satellite farm network, both in the UK and overseas. We access funding for research and development that brings these collaborative projects to life. We have business incubation facilities at our various hubs where we're able to uh, allow access for desk space, office space, workshop, lab space for SMEs and startups, but also overseas companies who may wish to gain a foothold in the UK. We have knowledge exchange and dissemination activity on the projects that we are involved with, and we influence policy by being well connected to government agencies. So our strategic, strategic pillars are at the Midlands Hub at Harper Adams, we have an ag robotics and ag engineering facility. At the Southern Hub at Cranfield, we have precision crop technologies with um, the various assets that I'll speak about shortly. With the livestock area, we're focused more on the dairy down at the Southwest Dairy Development Centre in Somerset. We have dairy and pig facilities at Harper Adams, and we have an aquacultural facility at Edinburgh University. We also have our precision farming data uh, asset, which is the capability we use on our satellite farms, both across the UK and also abroad, in New Zealand, in China, and in Paraguay. So our portfolio of assets includes the gantry and the glass house, which we'll be speaking about very shortly, but also our uh, cold storage facility, which looks at post-harvest optimization of perishable produce, um, both in the short term and long term, and the interaction between air, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and ethylene. And then we have a lot of smaller field-based and lab-based assets. We have soil flux chambers with a gas analysis capability. We have the remote sensing capability with the variety of drones with uh, RGB, multispectral, hyperspectral, and ground penetrating radar um, capability. We have the gamma ray sensor, we have spectrophorometers, we have infrared spectrometers, we have a plant growth chamber, and we have many, many more field-based and lab-based assets that are available to be used in projects. 
So the section of challenges we feel the need addressing are understanding soil and crop interactions, plant breeding studies, plant phenotyping and root phenotyping, seed technology and crop establishment trials, agrochemicals, biostimulants, biopesticide trials, linking pre-harvest environments to post-harvest outcomes with the cold store, sensor development and deploying those sensors in various um, of our assets, and climate change capability in to looking at uh, how increase in temperature in the climate has led to an increase in CO2 emissions from soil. We're looking at how carbon sequestration can be developed to um, drive towards net zero. Uh, if anybody wants to speak to me about any of those assets or any of those capabilities or indeed talk about collaborative projects, please contact me on the details below. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lindsay and Duncan, for that introduction and to CHAP and AgriEpi. And if we've got any questions for the AgriTech centres, we'll be happy to pick these up in the Q&A session later on in the webinar. We're now going to move on to a short video showcasing the phenotyping and um, crop storage faci uh, crop so um, facilities at Cranfield. And we're going to bring that up now. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully that video has piqued your curiosity into the phenotyping and soil health facility at Cranfield and acts as a nice segue into our main section of the webinar. And I'm now going to invite Dr. Toby Wayne and Professor Wilfred Otten to share their presentations. And they're really going to be delving deeper into the technical aspects of the capabilities and showcase a couple of case studies of projects that have run within the facilities. So Toby, Wilfred, over to you. Thanks everyone for joining today. My name is Toby Wayne and I'm the Head of Remote Sensing at Cranfield and the Academic Lead for the Phenotyping Facilities in the New Glasshouse. Today I'm giving a talk and a virtual tour of the Phenotyping Facilities. So welcome to Cranfield. Um, as you can see on the left of the screen, our glasshouse is located conveniently next to our airport. So if you next time when you're actually available to visit, you can fly in. Um, but actually today's talk, um, I wanted to cover three main parts. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to set the context of digital agriculture and how the facilities feed into that. The second part is to explain the technical capabilities of the phenotyping facility. And then finally, I'll show two case studies that show experiments that we've been running recently. So automation in agriculture. A lot has changed in agriculture in the last 100 years or so. We've seen a huge revolution in the technologies used, um, such as the movement from horses through to tractors. Um, and the question I've posed in, to my lectures with my students is, is digital agriculture the next 
agricultural revolution. We've seen agricultural engineering, we've seen agrochemicals, and we've seen plant breeding. But do these technologies such as drones or even the decisions that are made digitally, are they the fourth revolution? So in this period, not only has the technology changed, but the size of farms has changed. If I think back to my own family farm, it's relatively small. Um, it used to be very common in the UK for lots of small family farms. But this is really changing. We now have um, the consolidation of businesses, and now you know, many farms are much larger than that. And that has a, a quite an impact on the way we actually make decisions about how we grow crops. So if I think about my own farm, my own family farm, um, I know exactly where the good parts and the bad parts of the farm are. But that's not the case now. We get contractors in, and many times they may never have actually even visited the field. So if they're going to make decisions or we're going to make decisions about these much larger areas with fewer people. We need to have as much information as possible. So really, um, my background is remote sensing. So I was really interested in thinking, how does that link through to the facilities that we're going to talk about today? So if we think about imagery collections, there's three areas where the decision support can be um, supporting the decisions. Uh, the first one is crop intelligence. So this is a simply the case where we take some imagery and then we use that to locate where problems might be occurring. So in the example slide, we've got a disease occurring. We can see this dark patch in this image. And this is the location of the septorium infection. The second part of the decision process, more advanced, is where we monitor that decision with some sort of equipment and then we make a decision. So a good example that's commonly used now would be variable rate fertilizer application with something like the end sensor. And then finally, uh, predictive. In this mode, and this is probably the most more, the most challenging of the three, we sense our field and we try to make some prediction of how things are changing. So in the example of the case of this disease outbreak, um, how early can we start to detect this disease? And can we model the, the way this disease spreads within a field? Because the decision in terms of action is to, in this case, it's organic celery, destroy part of the field. So the question, the exam question, if you like, is how much of the field do we need to destroy to stop spreading that? Is it just the local area around the disease or do we have to destroy a much bigger buffer around it or actually the whole field? So how does that link through to the facilities? How do these facilities address these challenges? So the main one is bridging the gap between laboratory and field research. And what I mean by that is we often know in laboratories how crops behave and let's say um, how the, the, um, the color or the spectral response of a crop might change to different um, input variables. But, but this, how does this translate into the actual field? It's, it's very difficult to replicate within a field trial um, the conditions that we're needing. So actually the grass glasshouse itself, with all the automation that's, that's inside this glasshouse, such as heating and ventilation control, et cetera, et cetera, allows us to control the experimental variables with much more precision. We also, if you look carefully inside the glasshouse, you'll see the green and blue crane. This is a gantry system mounted inside with this large box, which contains a set of sensors. In fact, there's six sensors. I'll talk about those in a bit more detail. And the other, um, part that's interesting from the, um, which makes these facilities unique is the ability to put large blocks of soil to simulate, if you like, small fields that we can then tessellate and locate inside the glass house and then scan with the facilities. And my, my colleague Wilfrig will talk about that in the next presentation. Then the thing I quite like about the glass house is how tall it is. So the sensor box can, as well as moving and scanning across any of the area in the X and Y directions, it can also scan in the vertical direction. We have about three and a half meters of height adjustment. So that allows us to grow everything from um, small, very small crops growing on the benches right up to um, very tall crops such as maize. And the types of things we're looking at are soil, plant, water interactions, and then disease detection. And these themes will run throughout the, the next few slides. So what do the facilities look like when they're running? Of course, you can't actually go inside the glasshouse when the 
devices running because there are some of the sensors which give off um, electromagnetic radiation which could be damaging to your eyes. So we recorded this video, um, which is actually scanning a small tea plant. Um, it's collected. This is actually red, normal red, green, and blue imagery. And then we take the over the same area um, a very detailed LIDAR image. And as you can see, you can see the three-dimensional structure of the tea plants in um, extreme detail. So what sensors are on the, the platform? We actually have a suite, and if we start from the bottom, we see there's a, a CO2 sensor. Then the first notable imaging sensor will be the LiDAR scanner. So we have two LiDAR laser scanners operating, both fitted at 30 degrees. We have two because then it allows us to build up an image from both sides of the plant, so we can try to see as much of the plant as possible. We have a thermal camera in the middle here. Then if we move up, we have the, a very high resolution visible RGB camera and then LED lights in order to control the lighting. Then to the left, we have two um, hyperspectral cameras. We have a visible near infrared and a shortwave infrared camera, and they have halogen lighting. Um, and then finally, the really big sensor on the right is this um, fluorescence sensor. This sensor, there's an array of LEDs you can see in this in the circle here. They shine extremely um, high intensity of red light around uh, 534 nanometers, I believe, um, onto a plant. And then you cut the lights and then the plant fluoresces back. And this small fluorescence measurement is made by the camera in the center. And that's directly related to the photosynthetic activity of the plant. If we use all of our scanners and all of our sensors, and we take one image over the whole area of the glasshouse, we collect seven terabytes of data. So you can see there's actually some really interesting big data challenges as well. So moving on to some of the experiments. So this experiment on um, quite two are quite unusual plants, um, quinoa and cowpea, uh, was running um, over the autumn and winter this year, actually. So it's just finished this experiment. Uh, and you can see the layout. We were using the benches, and we've got a mixture of the two species, actually, on this bench. And in the background, if you look carefully, you can see the boxes, which Wilfred will talk about a bit later on, these soil cubes. Um, but the next experiment, you can see we want to be able to image the plants when they're very small, but we can also image them when they're very tall. So here's some examples of the types of sensor output we get from that platform. So on the left, we have a, a LiDAR image of the quinoa. Um, the LiDAR point cloud, it's actually, um, it's actually higher resolution than it appears on the screen here. Um, if you zoom right in, you can see the point cloud is actually um, up to 0.25 of a millimetre. So that means you can actually see the detail of the, um, the grains on top of the canopy. Uh, we've got uh, an RGB camera at the bottom, so that allows us to use a standard, almost to simulate how a drone works, a, a kind of standard drone. We have a thermal camera on the bottom right, and then of course we have uh, the two visible near infrared and short wave infrared um, hyperspectral cameras, and they run between 380 and 2,500 2, nanometers uh, with up to 1.1 or 2 millimeter pixels, depending on the height of the platform. So what does that look like if you actually look at the plants? How do those plants, how are they responding in this experiment? Um, you can see visibly that there are differences in the color of the, the plants, and you can see there are differences in the canopy structure. And those, and often your experiments are trying to look at these, um, look to see if there are any significant differences with response to treatments. So our, our platform allows us to, within the context and the layout of the experiment, monitor both the spectral and the canopy structure throughout the growing season. Then another case study is early disease detection. So in this, this is a typical layout for a, a wheat experiment that might be conducted on the bench. Um, in the background, you can see a canopy, so it looks like there's been some inoculation going on in here. Um, in our image on the right, we have um, an example of, the, of a um, visible near infrared image, and we've below, we've got the spectral profile from the two locations. So if we look carefully, you can see the um, the powdery mildew spots on the leaf, and I've collected a spectra from the red line from on top of the lesion, and then on the right, a healthy part, and both the leaves are at roughly the same angle to the camera as well. 
And what we can do is we can use, um, because it's a, a hyperspectral image, we can see the whole spectra. So we have a, a typical healthy vegetation curve, the green line. And as you can see, as the infection is taking effect, it's changing the shape of this profile. And what we can do then is use the hyperspectral imagery to actually detect within the image, because this is just one pixel we're looking at here, every single pixel in this image has spectra. So we can automate the way of finding where these particular lesions are occurring. <clears throat> and of course, the other way of looking at it would be to actually do some uh, computer vision on the image itself. So rather than looking at individual pixels, we could try to find the shape and the spectral information and identify what the, the patterns of how these look on the leaves. So I thought I'd finally show a, a slide, which is one of the ones I, I use with my students, um, which is, is what we actually had this slide. I found this slide before we actually even had the gantries um, and the glass house installed at Cranfield. And what struck me about this particular slide was this um, infield gantry system. And what I liked about it was this was actually the, the robotic arm and the manipulation of the plants from the robotic. Um, and that got me thinking, that got me thinking about, well, actually, could you manipulate and grow a, a whole plant system vertically from the gantry? Um, and of course, if you could do that, you wouldn't necessarily need to have one massive monoculture of a particular crop. You could actually, as well as like we do with the varying inputs for uh, monoculture, we could actually vary the planting. So we could actually have a, a heterogeneous mix of different species. And that has some quite interesting implications in terms of um, thinking for what the future of agriculture might be. But it also leads to the question about what's, what is the actual appropriate scale to actually manage a crop? So at the, currently, we often manage our fields at the, the whole field scale. And then if, we, if we've invested in precision farming equipment, we might be maybe changing um, different applications across the boom or even sections of the boom. But actually, in the future, when we have the ability to identify individual plants, is that going to be the unit? Is that actually the best unit for treatment? Or is it actually... So is it the individual plants or is it maybe even a leaf on a plant? So if I can spot that lesion of that disease, maybe pre-symptomatically, could I actually treat it with a very small amount of chemical and thus really reduce the overall application rate? Or is it even down to the cell level? So we don't actually know these, the answers to these questions yet. These are all open research questions. Now facilities allow us to actually investigate some of these. So finally, really to wrap up, um, <clears throat> thank you for listening to the um, section on the um, phenotyping. I'd like now I'd like now to hand over to my colleague um, Wilfred, who's going to talk about the um, soil health aspects of the facilities. Thank you, Toby, and good afternoon all. Thank you for joining this Zoom call. Um, my name is Wilfred Dalton. I am one of the academics at the Cranfield Soil and Agri Food Institute. Uh, working with the crop health and protection facilities at our campus. Toby has mainly focused on above ground uh, parts and how the phenotyping platform could help us to assist in detecting crop health. And this part, we will take you below ground and look at crop soil interactions and how we can improve our crop health, our soil health. First, I will take you uh, around uh, what the facilities would have looked like if we had been able to welcome you over the last year. So what you will see here are uh, lysimeters. We have 24 of those very large lysimeters. They are one cubic meter each in which we can uh, uh, set up experiments looking at soil crop interactions. As you can see, each of the lysimeters is uh, standing on a large weighing platform that will allow us to record crop uh, water use and soil water use, as well uh, steer an automated irrigation system. You can see each uh, uh, lysimeter has an individual uh, designed uh, irrigation system that can be made to tailor your needs. You will see on the side uh, those white boxes. Uh, these are uh, wireless data connectors uh, that will allow us to record soil temperature and soil water content at various depths in these profiles. Finally, you can see 
uh, diagonally, there are some tubes inserted in these lysimeters. These are risotrons. They allow us to lower a camera below ground and uh, have a look at the root development in situ. So these are truly uh, unique facilities and they have been designed um, to capture the entire crop cycle. So what do we mean by that? We can start with tillage and drilling and I'll show you in a moment. Then we can follow it through through plant establishment and crop development in our glass house and take it further with our post-harvest research group to harvesting and post-harvest research. But uniquely, we can subsequently bring them back into uh, the glass house and go full cycle again. So this in contrast to many studies that are done in the laboratory will allow us to uh, consider whole crop production cycle in a, within a rotational context. We believe that that is important as very often benefits are noted in subsequent seasons. Secondly, we're able to recreate dynamic relationships between crop and soil um, at a realistic field scale or more near field scale and in real time. That will allow us to look at soil health, water use and retention, biotic stresses and environmental variables. And unlike in the field where we have to deal with a large heterogeneity of soil as well as environmental variability, we are more in control of all those conditions within this glass house. And finally, this system, like uh, the, the ones that Toby spoke before, uh, is uh, under the phenotyping platform. So the platform can be extended over the experimental setup that I've been showing you here. So I'll start this with uh, the tillage part of it that I mentioned. There's uh, quite a few pictures on here and I'm sure you'll be distracted by the little video. Uh, but I'll start at the top left of this where you can see that each of those lysimeters are separate experimental units which we can move about in the glass house and place so we can make sure our facilities are randomized. But we can also drive it outside the glass house and put them all together, as you can see in the image below that, to prepare for tillage operations. In doing so, we will remove the side panels to create one long soil surface. And uh, in that, through that soil surface, we can uh, operate tillage operations, like for example, the tie discs that uh, are shown in the image uh, next to it. Our soil processor hangs over these uh, boxes and drives over it at a speed that is controllable, as you can see in the picture in the top right. And then we can operate tape, the, we can operate the tillage operations, such as seen in the little video for a different example. So this means that we can replicate as much as possible what would happen in the field. Uh, this ties in with long-standing expertise at Cranfield University in soil mechanics and tillage uh, operations. But now through these facilities, we're able to extend it into crop growth and the impact it has on crop growth. Now, soil structure is one of the key drivers of soil processes and soil health. So it is very important in your experimental systems that you recreate that as realistic as you can. Tillage isn't the only way by which we can control and manipulate our, our soil structure. As you're aware, soil crops are um, doing uh, a, a large, uh, doing this to a large extent as well. And this takes me to our first example of some of the work that's been going on in these facilities, where we have tried to identify uh, functional root traced and classify these to see whether or not they can bring multiple uh, multiple soil functions or improve multiple soil functions. What you see here is examples of root systems of seven uh, cover crops and they range widely from fine haired systems to the thick reddish uh, root systems that we are familiar with and we may intuitively think, think which ones would improve what surfaces with the nutrient uptake maybe in the finer roots and the uh, thicker roots may be more capable of creating pores but there's little evidence out there yet to substantiate that and what we are interested in is not improving one 
quality, but to improve several of them at the same time. So we are asking ourselves the question, what are the root traits? Can we identify root traits, associate them with improvements of soil functions like erosion control, runoff, soil structure? And um, can we then subsequently determine what the optimum uh, mixture of these root systems would be? So if you wish, it is to help you identify a crop selection based on root traits uh, rather than just the yield alone. Um, you'll see here some of the results in there, but first I'll take you to the images. Now you can see the Rhizotron camera that I made reference to before. It is inserted in the tube here. We can lower it in there. It will turn around and take a, a picture of 360 degrees, which you will see an example of below. So these images are of very high quality. Um, if we zoom into that, we would even be able to see root hairs. So we can quantify the density of roots that's being formed. We can follow the rate at which they extend through soil and in particularly how they respond when they encounter less favorable zones. We followed this experiment and did additional measurements, of course, and looked at aggregate stability, the hydraulic conductivity, infiltration rate, where the porosity was increased, etc. So we took various measurements of soil health, and we tried to identify the root traits that were quantified from these images, such as the thickness of the root, the length density, the number of branches, um, etc. At, and the depth at which they are. And you can see a little example of how various root traits were affecting different soil variables. This is the first part of the work that we've been doing. We have used this part now to identify uh, species mixtures which we expect to have multiple benefits. So say, for example, we want to improve both the porosity as well as the aggregate stability, which uh, by the looks of this requires different root traits. So we have tried to identify mixtures of cover crops that will deliver these root traits for us and test if indeed all soil variables will be improved. This mixed species experiment in the glasshouse has been completed and an additional field testing of this has also been completed, but the results are currently being analyzed. So I hope to be able to share these with you in the near future. In this second example, we looked at root traits and soil compaction. And in particular, in this case, we looked at some deep compaction. So through our soil process, we brought in a compacted layer at 40 centimeters depth onwards of 1.4 density and the top layer, a lower density of 1.2. And we compared that with a profile where there was no deep compaction and we uh, uh, grew tomato plants with different genotypes on there, where one genotype was expected to be able to cope better with soil compaction than the other one. As you can see, the growth of the tomato, both above ground and below ground, was affected both by genotype and by the soil compaction, as one would expect for the latter, most certainly. Um, but uh, the results are not necessarily pointing in the same direction. So um, we concluded from that that one of the alleles um, uh, for so one of the genotypes uh, can be uh, selected when you want to increase your biomass on the soil compaction. There was an increase of 33% that we noted. Um, however, this might only uh, work when resources do not limit growth, um, because if resources are limited growth, you may not observe that same benefit and actually observe a yield reduction. So the selection is, is a little bit more complicated than just focusing on, on one problem, but it does demonstrate the importance of studying the below and above ground at the same time and how these interactions are evolved. The final example is work that we are scheduling for the coming year and which is uh, supported by Syngenta, which will look at terrestrial field soil dissipation studies. These studies look at uh, uh, herbicide uh, breakdown rates for regulations and are normally done in the field. Um, field trials are very expensive, probably about 1.5 million each for a trial like this. Uh, and there are a few problems have been observed. 
uh, when the reasons for those are not particularly clear. One of them would be that after the herbicide is applied and if sampling happens immediately, recovery is never 100%. Various causes have been investigated, but one of them could be the heterogeneity of the application and the soil. So obtaining better control over these factors will allow us at least to exclude that as an explanatory variable. So this is important to know because of course that reduction has an immediately impact or incomplete recovery on your estimate of uh, uh, the persistence of the chemicals in the environment. Secondly, we want to know uh, what the impact is of some uh, new requirements to cover the soil with a layer of sand. In particular, uh, we expect this to affect the microbial population and subsequently the breakdown of the herbicides. Uh, and we want to know if the data that we get from that after covering are still representative for what happens in the field. So how realistic are the data that are obtained in these type of field trials which need to be done compared to when we wouldn't have that cover layer. This will inform uh, uh, the development and uh, the uh, data on persistence in the environment. So these were just a couple of examples of the type of work that we have been doing and are doing. Uh, there's more work going on, but I can't give you uh, the examples of all the work that's been going in the in in this time scale. Um, but I would like to. Uh, uh, but I hope that this has been giving you some impression of what you can do with us if you want to work with us. Um, and I've demonstrated that this can be done through both research council work as well as directly industry funded work. So the examples we can look at with you, for example, are to harness the potential of soils for crop growth. So can we improve organic matter? Where does it need to be in the profile? How much? What are the benefits? Can we manipulate our root system to enhance resource capture? Other examples, as we already demonstrated, what are the rooting habits to create soil structure? Can we improve soil structure? Basically, can we bioengineer our soils? What optimum selections of species and mixes can we use? And through Toby, uh, we have uh, learned about the smart cultivations and precision agriculture examples. It's important to point out that the uh, uh, lysimeters that have been demonstrating you are not intended to replicate what happens in the field. They are intended to recreate realistic conditions and realistic problems that occur in the field to test whether or not either your sensor work or the efficacy of the product that you have in mind to improve crop yield. That was a quick overview of the uh, lysimeter part of the facilities um, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Toby and Wilfred, for your presentations. Can I now invite all four panel speakers to now switch on your cameras and take yourself off mute um, and also keep your questions coming in. We've got a couple of questions that we want to address first up, so I'm just going to pull these up. Um, so the first question I've got is how do controlled environmental experiments translate to the field and farm scale? And Wilfred, it might be useful maybe for you to take this one first. Uh, okay, so I think um, they are particularly sitting in between what I would say more fundamental studies in the lab and, and in the field. Um, and because of the size that we have uh, in the experiments, they are sufficiently large to be realistic representation of what you encounter in the field. Um, but at the same time, under controlled conditions. So if you would go in the field, they would want to investigate uh, the effect of compaction and how, how you can put something in place to remediate against that, then you are dependent on, on your climate and all the variability in the field. So very often you'll find that your results are obscured by some environmental heterogeneity or variability you're not in control over. So by taking control over that and bringing it into the glasshouse, we will be 
quicker able to identify whether or not something works and better tailor the advice for specific conditions in the field. So I see it as an intermediate step that should help to bring particular solutions onto the market quicker. Okay, great. And more specifically, Duncan, um, if we were to think more specifically about remote sensing, how did the pilot studies in the glass house translate into the field? Uh, I guess that uh, having a controlled environment space gives you um, perfect conditions to work in, which is what you don't get when you are trying to do something in the field. So if you're limited, limited by flying a drone in the weather, which is you know the wind and the rain, or if you're looking at satellite imagery, you're going to be affected by clouds, particularly in the UK. Uh, so it gives us the option to have the perfect conditions that we need to look for the markers we're looking for. Okay, great. So we've had a question from John Bloomer who's asked, does LiDAR provide detailed route images within the boxes? And if so, um, how, how fine of detail is produced? So Toby, I don't know if you want to pick that one up. Yeah, so the, the LiDAR system that I um, explained earlier, it looks at, it's a, it produces um, infrared light which bounces off the surface of an object. So actually, um, maybe Wilfred could say something about the ways of measuring the, the route detail, because I think he showed an, an example of a camera. So maybe Wilfred. Yeah, so we, we won't use the LiDAR for that, for the reasons that Toby already explained. So the route camera, which uh, I demonstrated, which go really down to the level of, of route hairs. Uh, but it's only one of the methods. I mean, we use that particularly to uh, follow things over time. So you can follow rate and, and branching angles and route development. Uh, in addition to that, we tend to take destructive measurements to take uh, uh, more, more direct measurements of route density. Uh, but these will generally take the route structure apart. So you lose your geometry. Uh, if you really want to know more about the geometry and the way the interactions are between roots and soil. We tend to take soil cores and use X-ray tomography, and that will give us a 3D distribution of pores and roots, and that will give us a better understanding of how the roots interact with the soil structure. So, uh, so it's not through LIDAR, but we do have additional techniques, uh, and probably it depends on what the questions are in the in the product or in the in the project, or what would be the most suited tool for that. Okay, thanks Wilfred. And picking up that final bit of John's um, question about the fine detail, Lindsay, maybe this is something you could pick up on. You know, the Crown and Field Phenotyping Facilities, how does that relate, for example, to some of other CHAPS facilities, for example, at Rothamsted? Oh, well, at Rothamsted, we have our fine phenotyping laboratory. Um, and also Rothamsted have the um, field scale uh, scan analyzer. So there's a whole sort of story there. You could go from the lab, from the field to the lab, and then again to these uh, phenotyping gantry at Cranfield. There's a whole pathway there, depending on what project you're, what you're trying to achieve. Okay, great. Um, we've got a question from Pierre Graves, who mentions that they have a precision viticulture system um, that uses an IoT broadband connectivity. And he's asking if there's a UK-wide directory of IoT coverage for farmland in the UK. Um, Duncan, Toby, maybe this is a question for you guys to pick up. Uh, I'll have a go first, if you like. I mean, connectivity is a massive problem um, in the UK, I think. You know, there's lots and lots of sensors out there that have the ability to transmit data or you have to go and download data. I think probably the biggest problem is actually what you do with the data once you've collected it uh, and how you make it into decision making, um, real decision making sort of tools. Okay. Um, so we have a question around the facilities. So we'll ask a question, can anyone do projects in the phenotyping and soil health facilities? And if so, who do they contact? Um, I can pick that one up. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a question we often get asked, actually. Um, I think there's some sort of perception that it's only for academics. Um, but no, um, the facility is, is open to all, um, either funded by, you know, grant funded projects or commercially funded projects. Um, and I guess the best person to contact would be um, inquiries at CHAP or inquiries at AgriEpi um, or Wilfred or Toby as a, as a starting point. I think we've got uh, the contact details at the end of Jenna. Yes, we do. We do. Yeah, no, we're open to all. So um, as long as you can afford to pay for it, we'll do it. <laughs> 
Um, and Wilfred, we've had a question about the rise from cameras. Um, are these just reserved for glasshouse workers? There an opportunity to take these out into the field as well? No, sorry, I should have mentioned that in my talk probably, but uh, these can be taken out in the field. Um, we sometimes have a bit of a problem in installing them, so we need to get the right time on that. But we do use them in in the field as well in projects. Uh, so we can uh, relatively easily buy a few more of those tubes and the camera can be brought around and take images. That's so. And I noticed there's, an ex uh, there's a question from David Blacker is asking um, whether the, the root experiments, that, you know, whether or not these have been published and if they've been published, are they free to view? Um, I'm not sure which experiment you, you refer to, but if it's the cover crop um, that has just been submitted, so it's under review. Um, so hopefully we get that published uh, shortly and we would publish under open access. So that would be free to review uh, the second publication on that with the mixtures and the field work we expect uh, around September because our analysis has been a, a bit delayed due to lab access. So we're still working uh, on that. Um, the one with Syngenta and Rootstock is part of a larger project um, and I'm not totally sure when that will be made uh, public. That's... Okay, thank you. Um, I've got another question here from John Bloomer who's asking, could the facilities um, be used to investigate soil fertility versus soil microbiome versus soil agronomy or cropping? So I'm guessing this is open to, to everybody, but um, Wilfred, do you want to pick that up first? Y yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not totally sure if I fully understand the question about uh, the versus one versus the other, but I, I assume it's trying to identify what would be a most efficient way of achieving something, whether it's through agronomy or through mi microbiology. Uh, it's not a question I've asked uh, be before, to be honest. So I wouldn't be able to say, yes, we can do that. But of course, uh, we can do specific interactions on this in, in, in particular ways. So we could uh, design experiments that, that address this type of questions. Uh, should we be, be interested? Uh, in that. Um, uh, we tend not to ask if it's one better than the other, but more focus on the interactions which we think are particularly important. So we would very often design something where specific tillage operations or handling might be combined with a fertilizer application or a, uh, a, a microbial application. So that's, Great, I hope that answers you. it. <laughs> If not, come back John, to me. If, <laughs> if it doesn't, John, then we can follow up afterwards. Yeah. Um, our next question is from Robert Adcock, who's asking, um, will the continuing loss of actives be offset using these new technologies and techniques in a cost-effective manner? Again, Wilfred, I don't know if you want to start on that one, then we can maybe pass that off. So, sorry, I missed something. Can you repeat it? That's... Yeah. Will the continuing loss of actives be offset using these new technologies and techniques? in a cost-effective manner? Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, it is a way that will help us to find alternatives for it faster. So that, that's the way I see the facilities. Um, of course, for replacements for actives and find other ways, we need to have other ways of doing things and find either find other products or find ways by which we can improve our soil health and get more natural uh, resistance, depending on what, what, what the problem is. And I think these sort of things can be uh, investigated quicker in these sort of facilities and subsequently be tailored more to uh, what happens in the field. Uh, particularly, I would say, if we start thinking about microbial solutions, uh, uh, probably uh, more so than chemicals, they may be far more reliant and dependent on, on the conditions that are encountered in the field. So we may uh, need to search into far more tailored solutions towards soil types and say, well, this works under that soil type, under that condition, and I think we'll have with these facilities more control over our, our window of opportunity for getting products on the market quicker. So it's not, not replacing it, of course, because I think we need to find solutions and ideas to replace it, but it is a, a way of, of accelerating uh, the ideas uh, to bring them to market. Great, thanks Wilfred. 
Um, our next question comes in from Nick, who asks, what range of individual plant diseases can be identified through RGB and near infrared imagery? And Toby, this is maybe one for you to pick up here. Yeah, it definitely fits into my area. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if you're if you're looking just in the RGB or the visible and the near infrared infrared range, you're often if you're flying a drone, for instance, you would be often using some sort of uh, simple indice like normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI. Um, and you can't necessarily identify which particular disease it is using that. You can only really tell that there's a problem with the plant. Um, but what the facilities allow us to do is to use the visible near infrared hyperspectral cameras and to um, identify specific spectral response for particular diseases and then attempt to see whether you could find particular wave bands which might be useful to build a low cost sensor. Um, and then if you can select those particular bands, then you can actually put those onto a drone um, and try to optimize the, the, the particular parts of the wave band you're, you're using to try to find a particular disease. So in a, in a production system, you might have a particular crop that you're interested in, a particular set of diseases. There may be um, particular wave bands which are of interest. Um, and, and the facility allows us to, because we have such high resolution of the visible near infrared um, hyperspectral camera of about one millimeter, that means we can, at every pixel location in that image, we have a similar spectral response to someone using a spectrometer on like actually on the leaf disease so yeah that that's kind of one of the the main um, reasons why we're getting quite a lot of interest at the moment in looking at studying how early we can detect diseases and and um, and then then actually with the purpose of actually using those on drones later on great thanks toby um, I think we're running out of time now for questions. So thank you very much to each of our panelists um, for your presentations today and also for your um, responses to our questions. We're now gonna move on to an exciting announcement. So I'm just gonna share my screen again. So we'll invite you all to switch off your cameras again um, while I share my screen. Um, okay, hopefully that'll be coming up um, shortly now. So yeah, I guess we just want to conclude with a really exciting announcement. Um, we're really excited to announce today that we are launching a dual international agri-tech membership scheme that brings together AgriEpi as well as CHAP um, with an international offering for businesses where they can gain access to those world leading UK facilities such as those that we've mentioned today in the phenotyping, the soil health facility, um, as well as the other capabilities that span CHAP and AgriEpi. It's also access to world-class expertise, um, the UK farm network, an opportunity to test and trial new and emerging technologies, as well as support um, business support services. And by joining this international dual membership, you get access to this 200 strong membership scheme across both agri-tech centres. So very exciting um, launch, very exciting announcement. And if you'd like to know any more information about this dual membership at the contact details, are on the screen. So just to finish up, I want to thank each of our panellists from today. You know, thank you very much for your presentations and also thank you all for joining and for your excellent um, questions that have been coming in. If we didn't get a chance to reach your questions or you didn't get a chance to ask your question, please feel free to forward these on to us and the contact details are on your screen and we can pick these up. Similarly, if you've got any questions about the Agritech centres and our offering or um, Cranfield University, then please do get in contact. Um, and all that's left to say is thank you very much for joining and stay safe. Thank you.